Well, thank you very much. What, uh, what Mike did, left out of the, my very impressive obituary, I mean resume, is that I'm the son of a rural electric lineman born in a town called Can Do, North Dakota. And let me tell you, Jasper's only spent a month there, but if, when he's been there two months, he'll, if he hasn't already noticed, there is a different work ethic in Washington, D.C. than there is in rural America. And what he says about the preservation of rural values as enough of a reason to invest is right on point. It is almost frightening to see how so much of our country, for whatever reason, sends people to Washington whose primary policy purpose is to create enough incentives for people to not work that they're equal to those that do. Can you imagine building rural America with a value that says, gee, don't worry about work, we'll make sure you're taken care of if you don't, regardless of your circumstance. My dad is a retired rural electric lineman now, living in the town of Kindred, suffering uh, with uh, bone cancer, and still mows the football field every week for the school. And yet I hear every day people get up on the house floor and say, yeah, yeah, but let's perpetuate an entitlement society. We couldn't build rural America with an entitlement society. But we do our best to provide the resources to maintain our position of leadership in building this great country. Well, we just came off of a big election. You all get to watch, uh, you all get to watch TV again. And uh, yeah, in some peace and quiet, you can now watch uh, Ford truck ads instead of political ads. God bless you. But even before the new Congress is sworn in, there's some heavy lifting to do. You know, I, my whole speech has been changed a couple times just since walking in the building. A couple of things I want to talk about with regard to the lame duck session coming up. Um, we're going to have some tax extenders that we have to, to vote on. It's interesting because there are about 50, I think, tax extenders. The, those are the parts of the tax code that the Congress likes to just, you know, extend every few years. That keeps the lobbyists coming back to us on a regular basis, I guess. And some of them are really important to our country and very important to rural America. A day does not go by and hasn't gone by in the last year that I haven't heard about 179 expensing. That is to say that is the deduction, of course, that you get to use if you're buying a new combine <laughs> or new equipment. 179 expensing is a real big deduction. It's one of the 50 or so extenders that will be voted on in the lame duck. We've already voted on it in the House. We made it permanent. Yeah, sure, it's nice to have the the PACs and the lobbyists coming back to you every couple of years, we prefer to create certainty in the tax code that allows the farmer, the rancher, the small business owner to know what the rules are every day of every month of every year rather than waiting and hoping that they can, get, they can deduct their investment retroactively. So we made it permanent, that's on the table. We also made permanent uh, bonus depreciation for those of you buying jet airplanes or other big things, that is the opportunity to depreciate up to 50% of a capital intensive investment in your business. Big stuff. We made it permanent in our bill. R&D tax credit, we also made permanent a, a, a third bill. We also made permanent charitable IRA rollover. For those of you that are not quite 72 but might have the opportunity in your estate, to, uh, to give it to your favorite charity or church and some other things related to charitable IRA rollover. We want to make that permanent. So we pass those bills. What, what does all that mean in the context of a lame duck session? Because we also have, of course, several appropriations bills. One of the deals that we made with the Senate earlier this year in the Murray-Ryan budget deal was that we're going to pass a budget for the first time in several years, but you have to come to the table and we're going to go to back to regular order and pass appropriations bills as per our traditions. The House has passed several, the Senate's passed none. 
So we're forced now to come together again with either a continuing resolution or better yet an omnibus appropriations bill because the government is not being, is, is, funding runs out on I think it's December 6th. Why does it matter that the House has passed all of these appropriations, all of these tax provisions, while the Senate hasn't? Well, it matters because now as we go into the lame duck, we feel like we have some leverage in the negotiation because all of the things that we've passed have strong bipartisan support in the House. They passed with votes from both parties. And now, as we go into negotiating with what was, what was once the most deliberative body, and hopefully will be again soon, we have the leverage to say, let's, let's make these things permanent. Now, are they going to make 179 expensing permanent? This Senate will never agree to that. They'll never agree to bonus depreciation being permanent. However, perhaps with our leverage, we can make it a five-year extension or a 10-year extension rather than a simple two-year extension with one of them already being behind us. I appreciate very much the WAPA presentation. One of the reasons, I'll never forget the day two years ago when I went to orientation, when Lamar Smith, the chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, came up to me with an invitation in his hand and said, um, Commissioner Kramer, he knew I was a public service commissioner, he said, I would sure like for you when you're sworn in to seek a position on the Science Committee. And I said, my goodness, the Science Committee, that wouldn't have been in my top 20. So why would you want me on that committee? And he said, because we're going to take up clean coal technology and hydraulic fracturing technology, and you're the only person in Congress that has a background in, in uh, cross-examining highly technical witnesses. And I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Let me on. So I've enjoyed tr tremendously the opportunity to cross-examine Gina McCarthy and Ernie Moniz and many other members of the administration when they come to us with they're one-size-fits-all regulatory regimes that do not ever take into consideration such things as the reliability of the grid or take into consideration things like um, commerce, which they're obligated by law to do, of course. Or when they come with an efficiency or conservation bill or idea that doesn't consider the modeling that has an impact not just on the utilities operations, but also on the utilities consumers. I'll never forget the phone calls we got the first time I asked a uh, DOE official, I said, what type of modeling do you use when you consider an efficiency plan? And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, do you consider the cost to the utility or do you consider the cost to every consumer? And they looked at me like, who invited you to the party? And I said, you do realize, of course, that while energy efficiency is oftentimes the lowest cost, it's not always the lowest cost, especially in a place that has extra capacity and low-cost electricity. That, in fact, punishing an elderly couple on a fixed income saddling them with the burden of having to invest in things that create the conservation or the efi efficiency that's supposed to save them money in their electricity bill isn't a savings at all. It's important to have more than just a general philosophy. I appreciate Jasper being here and, and appreciate so much the work of the Rural Utility Service. One of the bills, the appropriations bills, of course, that we are pledged to, uh, to pass is, is the uh, agricultural appropriations bill. That is one that um, came out of committee in the House uh, with some good news in it. Uh, we haven't passed it yet. Hopefully it will be a part of the negotiation. No doubt it will be here in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we, we, had to, uh, we had to fight a little bit for our U.S. in that one. So I and my team, and by the way, I have a 100% North Dakota staff. I'm not against people from other states, but I've seen some of them, and I'm not willing to take many chances. So we have a 100% North Dakota team. I am willing to consider other rural states uh, citizens as well. Um, but they worked on a letter. We set a record for the most members of Congress to sign a letter in support of our U.S. We had 166 169 signatures on our letter. Another 15 members wrote their own letters to the uh, 
to the appropriators and made sure that we restored full funding for RUS. Now, I appreciate that Jasper wants to hire those 25 people. We want them to be there. We want them to be productive. We want RUS to, uh, to respond favorably and quickly to the, to the applications. Efficient government is effective government. But I'd also like to lower their workload a little bit by doing away with some of the silly regulations that make it more difficult to get that money out the door. For example, one of the amendments we were able to pass in the House on the Farm Bill eliminated the requirement for a NEPA just because you're refinancing old debt. You don't change the environmental footprint one bit. You're just simply refinancing. That shouldn't require a NEPA. Well, uh, the do-gooders that do no good in the Senate didn't agree. Um, but the good news is that Secretary Vilsack, and no doubt working with Jasper, are working with us on the rules so that we can get back to some sanity. With regard to the EPA's rule, the Clean Power Rule, nothing has probably uh, taken on more importance in the last year than that with me. As you know, there are a number of bills that have been introduced, a number of, a number of uh, letters that have been written that uh, do everything from, we've asked for an extension yet, another extension of the comment period. We've also asked for a, a removal of the rule, of course. Um, with regard to the power plant, existing power plant rule, we've weighed in heavily, cross-examined every way possible. I think it's critical, and I appreciate so much the work that your leadership team has done in preparing me and preparing uh, the advocates in terms of our, uh, our committee work as well as, the, uh, as well as the comments. And filling that comment page is really important, really important. And some people think it doesn't make a difference. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. I know your issues. You, you know that I know the issues. Um, one of the bills that I'd sure like to see the Senate take up I doubt they're going to take it up this year, but I think next year we have a shot, is the, uh, what we call in, in the House the Whitfield-Kramer Bill. The Senate calls it the Manchin-Hoven Bill. It is the Electricity Affordability and Reliability Act that uh, requires Congress to take a look, to take a look at, uh, at the regulations before they become and accept them before they become law. It also requires uh, a true, a true honest assessment that, and that provides evidence that the rules even do what they are set out to do and that they are in fact, that the technology is in fact viable. We know for a fact so far that it is not, especially on, new, on the, new, uh, uh, the new plant rules, but on the existing plant rules, it's not enough to just set some standard that's impossible to meet and then walk away from it. So we've also worked very hard, I've worked very hard with the uh, with uh, Secretary Moniz and uh, the Science, Space, and Technology Committee to make sure that DOE uses its research and development dollars to not abandon, not abandon coal-fired power for the sake of other types of power, but to keep it in the mix and help us succeed in meeting the standards. See, I actually am a person who believes that the ingenuity is out there to meet some of the standards that we strive for. Whether you think we ought to or not is another debate. I was asked by a reporter in Washington, um, if I was one of the members of the science committee that doesn't believe in climate change, I said, it doesn't matter whether I believe in climate change. What matters is whether the remedy is worse than the climate change that they profess to be taking place. That's what matters. And so we're working on solutions. I believe those solutions probably will come from right here, probably come from Basin Electric. As long as we don't get the rule ahead of the technology. One of my favorite EPA stories, as long as we're going to tell them, and one of the biggest fights we're engaged in with them is this waters of the U.S. rule. And I made a lot of enemies when I outed the secret maps that the EPA and the Corps of Engineers were using to try and determine that every square foot of uh, the West was in fact a wetland that should be under their jurisdiction. That came out of our subpoena at the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. I would just encourage everybody, 
as this rule keeps getting worked on and comment period extended, we try to get extended further to get on and comment. Whether you're a rancher, farmer, just a homeowner, a utility, get on and talk about, get on that website and, and write your comments. And if you're looking for some good information, go on the SBA website and read the eight page letter that the office of the uh, SBA's uh, Small Business Administration Advisory uh, Office wrote opposing the rule, asking them to withdraw the rule. The rule. Their Office of Advocacy, which every agency has, some, some, some advisory committee, one, they hardly ever get used. The EPA almost never uses their Office of Science advisi advisories, but, advisors, but uh, we keep trying. But the Office of Advocacy at the SBA wrote an eight-page letter where it points out all of the problems and flaws in the waters of the U.S. rule. And it goes through the definitions. And those are that, if you're going to just read one set of bullets, read the definitions of waters of the United States. Let, ladies and gentlemen, waters of the United States was put in the Clean Water Act as the area that the federal government has jurisdiction, not because it's water, but because it's, quote, navigable water. In other words, the context of the federal government's jurisdiction has to do with interstate commerce. Everything else is for the states to have jurisdiction over under the Clean Water Act. The states have jurisdiction over their water. Navigable, to me, means you can put a barge on it and you can take North Dakota wheat to the Gulf Coast on it. That's navigable. But as you read through their definitions in the rule, and you get down to the seventh and eighth definitions, it says, and water as otherwise determined by the EPA and the Corps of Engineers, basically is what it says. It's a paraphrase. I hate to have to litigate everything with our federal government. So get on and, um, and comment. It really does matter. I'm optimistic about the new Congress. I'm optimistic that many of the good bills that we've passed in the House of Representatives, things like the RAINS Act, which says Congress should have an up or down vote on every regulation that is to, gonna have more than a $100 million impact on our economy. I'm anxious, I'm excited that bills like that are actually gonna get hearings in the Senate now, that they'll actually be brought up for votes. I'm very enthused about the appropriations process. Glad that now we will have an appropriations process in the Senate where they take up bills, appropriations bills, that they debate them, that it becomes deliberative again, and that they vote on them. Because even with 52 or 54 right-thinking senators and a few good Democrats, and there are a number of them that have been held back by their leadership, even if we don't get to 60, the appropriations process allows us with simple majorities to put limitations on appropriations. So I'm optimistic that we can stem the wave a little bit of overregulation, and that we can provide some appropriate guidance to the agencies through the appropriations process. Listening to the WAPA presentation reminded me that one of the greatest frustrations I've had with many of the, of the agencies, especially the EPA and the Department of Energy, is that they don't collaborate one with the other. In fact, on the clean power rule, one of the greatest frustrations to me has been that when you ask a DOE official or an EPA official if they, how much they've collaborated with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, they pretty much say very little to none at all. I say, how much have you collaborated with the local, your state, uh, the state public utility commissions and the public service commission? Very little to none at all. When you ask a FERC commissioner how much they've been consulted with regard to the EPA rules, they will either say nothing or they'll say not at all. And to ignore the dispatchability of low cost electricity, which is the standard, by the way, <laughs> lowest cost, it's a good energy plan. I don't think we need a lot more central planning for energy. The markets and the local regulators, state regulators and the, working with the FERC will do just fine and the consumer will do even better. 
So thank you for the opportunity to come before you. Thank you to the North Dakotans for the opportunity for this son of a rural electric lineman to be the only representative from an entire state. And I want you to know it gives me great honor every day to go to work knowing that I carry a brand, a brand that everybody is curious about. I get great satisfaction out of waking up every morning knowing that I have 434 colleagues that open up the Wall Street Journal and go, really? Them again? Why can't we be as successful as North Dakota? And to them I say, you can. <laughs> you can. Our whole country can. If you adopt the work ethic that comes from the prairies in the western part of our country, you too can be as successful as North Dakota. If you adopt the values of a limited government and fewer regulations, trusting the natural landscape, knowing that the people of the land care more about it than the bureaucrats, you too can be as successful as North Dakota. If you trust the natural order of things more than you trust the manipulation of an overreaching government, you too can be as successful as North Dakota. It's great to carry that brand when people are actually listening to what we have to say. And what we have to say is more, more than how to drill for and successfully recover oil. We're good at oil because we were first good at coal. We were first good at coal because we were first good at farming. We're good at commerce because we understand that the globe is the marketplace. And that the weather in Argentina affects the price in North Dakota. That Policies in Brazil affect what goes on in North Dakota. We've always been global people. And it all comes from our agrarian rural roots. We should never forget it. Never forget it. I never do. I want to end by just thanking you for making available to me the absolute best public policy team in this country. I do my job as well as I can because I have access to your team. You know, when you're, when you're the only congressman from an entire state, everybody thinks that you have the same resources as the senators. <laughs> we have about a third of the resource of each of them. That's why I hire only North Dakotans. I get twice as the work out of each person. But the real key is being accessible and resourceful and having people on speed dial like Mike and Dale and Steve, you know, and Daryl and... and, and and the entire team. Having Dennis Hill, being able to be able to call him and say, hey, how's this gonna affect rural North Dakota? That's really critical to us. It's a lot easier to be resourceful than it is to be really, really smart, right? So we lean heavily on resourcefulness. So thanks for what you do for North Dakota. Thanks for what you do for your entire region. Thanks for what you do for, uh, for our country. Thanks for what you do for me. Thank you. God bless you.